Okay, welcome back. Here's our program as it stands right now. We open a file. We're opening temp.txt. We set total to zero because we haven't seen any creatures yet. And then for each line that comes out of the file, that's what the for loop does for us, we take the line and strip off leading and trailing white space, split it on commas to get a list of substrings, take the third of those substrings, remember Python counts from zero, and convert it to an integer, and then add that integer into total to give us a running total of how many creatures we've seen. When we're out of the loop, i.e. when we've read all of the lines out of the file, we close the reader and then print a report. Here's how many creatures we saw. All right, this works sort of, but if you remember, we created temp.txt by throwing away the first two lines of our data file. One of them is the ID line from version control, and the other is the header with date, species, and count. Our real data files are going to have those lines, so we need a way to process them. We don't want to have to edit the data files and throw away useful information before we can process them. Well, let's switch back here and run IPython and take a look at another really useful feature, another one of those core concepts. If 0 is less than 1, print correct. And that prints the word correct. If 0 is greater than 1, print whoops. Doesn't print whoops. An if statement's job is to test a condition and do something only if that condition is true. Here, 0 is less than 1, so the if says, yep, that's true, I'll do whatever's in my body, whatever is indented underneath me. Here, 0 is not greater than 1, so that's false. Right. So the if says, nope, my condition was false, I won't do what was underneath me. What if we want to do one or the other thing? If 0 is less than 1, print correct. Else, print whoops. This should print correct. And if I change this to be if 0 greater than 1, print correct. Else, print whoops. This time it prints whoops. Else is only executed if the if isn't. Python will test the if. If the condition's true, it will do whatever is indented under the if. If the condition wasn't true, it will then go and find the matching else if there is one and do whatever is indented under it. So now I've got a way to do something or something else. And at this point, I have to explain the indentation. We've already seen it in for loops, for i in range 4, print i. As you've noticed, as your instructors probably already remembered to say, something that's in a loop is indented. Something that's in an if statement is indented. Why? Well, most programming languages use something like begin end keywords, or an open curly brace and a closed curly brace. But studies that were done in the late 70s and early 80s in Amsterdam by a group that actually informed a lot of the design of Python found that if you look at how people read programs, the only thing they actually pay attention to in order to figure out what's nested inside what is indentation. If there's a disagreement between how code is indented and where the curly braces or the begin ends are, they will trust the indentation. So they said, well, if indentation is what you're actually paying attention to, let's make it part of the language so that the two can never disagree, so that you can never have code that's indented one way but is actually going to be understood a different way by the computer. Python is one of the few languages whose design is actually based on studies of real programmers writing real programs. So, whenever you've got something like a for loop or an if else that controls other statements, those other statements, those other commands, have to be indented to make it clear visually what belongs to what. Now, you don't have to indent by any set amount. You could indent by one space, by a hundred spaces. Any given block has to be indented the same amount, 
because otherwise Python would get confused. And most people think that indenting four spaces is the most readable option. One space is very hard to see. A hundred is far too many for your eye to track. Many people use two, but the standard Python libraries all use four, so you should as well. All right, I've now got a way to do something if something's true. For example, four, number in range 10, if number is greater than 5, print big, else print small. Small, 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 big, 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 big. Remember it starts at 0. So 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all less than 5. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Sorry. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are not greater than 5, so we get small. 6, 7, 8, 9 are greater than 5, so we get big. And this is a very common pattern. Here's a loop that gives me one thing at a time. Inside the loop, I test, is this one of those or one of these? Is it up or down? Is it left or right? Let's come back to our program. I get the line, and I want to get rid of lines that start with hash and lines that start with date. Because if it starts with a hash sign, it's a comment. And if it starts with the word date, it's a title line. So, if line dot starts with, which is actually another method on strings, hash, pass. Don't do anything. Python has a special keyword, pass, meaning don't do anything. This is just a placeholder. It's often a good thing to throw into code while you're still exploring ideas. Okay. If line dot starts with the word date, pass, don't do anything. And then if line dot starts with anything else, you do this. Hmm. This is what I want, but this isn't quite the way to express it. As you can tell, there isn't an anything else character in Python. So what can I do here? Well, I could say if line starts with hash, don't do anything. Else, if line starts with date, here's another possibility, another test. We write it as LF, don't do anything. And then else, it isn't that case, it isn't that case, this is every other case, do the strip, the split, and the count. So, if it starts with a hash, don't do anything. Otherwise, if it starts with date, don't do anything. Otherwise, do this. Let's take a look at our data file again. Yeah, if it starts with hash, if it starts with date, otherwise. This seems like it ought to do the right thing. Let's give it a try. Oops, I'm already in the interpreter. My mistake. Let's go back to the command line and run countfish.py. Total number of creatures seen 30. Hey, it looks like it's doing the right thing. It's not. Take a look and see if you can spot the bug. That's right. I'm still reading from my test data file, temp.txt. It doesn't have any lines starting with hash or with date. I need to change the data file name back to Steve. 2012.txt. Now, let's try running Python. Okay, total number of creatures seen is 30. Do I believe this? Well, I'm a little suspicious. What I'm going to do is change that pass to say print skipping hash line, skipping date line. Otherwise, I'm going to add up the value. Good. Skipping a hash line, it is skipping a date line, and it's giving me the same answer I got from my test data set. Now I've got a lot of confidence that it's doing the right thing, because I'm actually seeing these statements executed. All right. This works. Can I make it cleaner? Well, I could say if line starts with that, or line starts with date, 
so that this test is true if either of those things is true, then pass. Let's see if that works. Yep, still giving me the right answer. I could even say, if not that, then do this. Now I'm starting to get past my comfort zone. If I read this, it says, if the following test is not true, then do a few things. What's the test? The test is the line starts with a hash or the line starts with date. So if it's not true that the line starts with hash or date, hmm. Okay, I'm finding this a little complicated to figure out, so I'm just going to undo and come back to that. If the line starts with hash or the line starts with date, then do nothing. And I'll even add a comment to make it, to remind my future self and to help other readers understand. Skip comments and data set title lines. Otherwise, add things up. Let's see if that still works. It looks like I've got an extra parenthesis there, left over from my earlier edit. Run it. Yes, it's working. This is how I would actually write this code. I, I wouldn't actually write this code. I would use a library function to read the whole data set and do it all in one operation, but we're trying to see how to build up to that. If I had to write this myself, this is how I would do it, because I understand the logic here. Yes, I could save myself two lines by saying not that, then do this. But I wouldn't do it because any savings of two lines now, I'm going to pay for over and over again in future as I try to understand the code. And this brings up something that makes programming and the teaching of programming difficult. The more you know about a particular programming language, the denser your code will become, just as the more you know about mathematics, the denser your calculations become. My daughter, who is five, is just starting to learn how to do multi-digit addition. We still haven't done carries yet, but she understands that 21 and 32 is added up in columns. She has to go through each of those steps one by one. I've been adding up numbers for 40 odd years. So for me, it's a single operation. I can use a much denser notation when I'm programming than somebody who's just a novice because I've got a richer vocabulary of patterns to match against to fit things into my short-term memory. This is about as far as I go, not because I couldn't go further, but because I've trained myself to write code that people who are doing their first programming class can actually figure out. There is actually a one-line solution to this problem. I would never use that because I don't want to fall into the habit of writing something which only takes up one line and then takes 15 minutes to figure out. I think anybody who can read Python can figure this out in one read. And I care about human performance much more than I care about saving a few bytes.